I'm yet to find a chemical substance that has more names than the one that you are going to discuss this morning, Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, otherwise known as cannabis, hashish, dope, zol, spliff, mtuz, wisdom, kuku, no mamu kwa simply called dacha in other areas. It was also discussed, believe it or not, in Parliament when the late Honorable Mario Ambrosini argued for its medicinal use. Good morning and a very warm welcome to Bonita's House Call here on SABC2. I'm Dr. Victor Ramatisede. We invite you to join our discussion by calling us on 011-362-4740 with your questions and comments on marijuana. Or you can send your SMSs to Bonitas double three seven two three. But we've also invited into the studio some aspects who have worked in one form or another, and some of them have thoroughly researched this substance and are prepared to share their experiences with us. Dr. Chan Shabarala, who's a specialist psychiatrist, Dr. Mamusino Di Chabu, the sports physician, as well as Dr. Shadi Montlana, who's a psychiatrist and director of Psychiatry Empowered. Huh. Psychiatry Empowered, Dr. Montlana, that sounds fancy. What is that all about? It's a PBO, and our work is to improve the awareness, mental health, um, literacy of South Africans, help with the understanding of mental illness in an attempt to destigmatize a mental illness. So we do that by doing what I do today, sharing our expertise, um, helping people understand mental illness better. We have a CPD program that we run from Riverfield Clinic. We've also done um, some outreach programs in Swaziland, Botswana, and we're looking at Namibia. Quite a lot of work, eh? Social media at any form? Because no. that, that's the main form of communication. Um, we haven't right? done very much um, on social media, mm. but we are looking at it. It's hard work. <laughs> mm, I'm sure it is, <laughs> but you seem to be enjoying it. Yes. Dr. Adi Chaba, Dr. Jan Chabarala, we're going to talk. She's a sports physician. She's going to tell us about marijuana and how people in sports, boxing, and other football, of course. You know, when you grew up, they were, they were, they were team maybe, so I would ask, pay me now. It was known that these are the guys who start by smoking tar. I'm not sure if it still happens today. And Dr. John Chabarala, you're going to give us a little bit more about what happens on the psychiatric side. But first, let us hear what this chemical compound is all about. Let's watch. So marijuana is a um, a plant that is grown throughout the world in, in temperate to hum in tropical areas of the world. And the, the main use of it is, uh, it's generally uh, considered to be what we call a hallucinogen. So it, it causes some change in perception, usually uh, mainly visual perception, but in, in sometimes other types of perception. Um, patients uh, t uh, will tell you about changes in time. Time is one of the one things that they tell you that uh, is distorted, quite a lot of distortion there. And there's also a lot of memory loss um, and there's also some perceptual distortions besides that. There's also, there can be also quite intense paranoia and anxiety that also accompanies uh, marijuana. Marijuana um, contains a lot of different type of substances, but the, the one which is thought to be the most psychoactive, that's the one that affects the brain the most, is a substance called 9-tetrahydrocannabinol. And the higher the concentration in the marijuana leaf or in the plant, the more psychoactive it is. And um, it's thought that this substance called 9-tetrahydrocannabinol then interacts with different receptors in the brain. And these receptors in the brain mediate feelings of pleasure, of, they sometimes uh, in, um, do mood and time perception and thought perception. And when we uh, have high concentrations of marijuana that contain 9-tetrahydrocannabinol, it obviously almost overstimulates these receptors. We, we do know that there are physiological purposes for these receptors. We're just not entirely sure what they are at the moment. Um, and we do know that uh, these substances, especially 9-tetrahydrocannabinol, can overstimulate those receptors. And cause um, a altered perception. And so what um, patients will, or clients will complain about is, or not complain about, they, they will say that they have altered perception, they have, um, time often seems to be standing still, 
Um, they often have uh, intense paranoia and anxiety, but also euphoria. And, and remembering that euphoria is really the thing that most addicts crave, is that they, they like that euphoric feeling. And that's really what they become addicted to. And, and they chase that first feeling of euphoria. So what's euphoria? Euphoria is when you're feeling good. You're feeling uh, good. We feel good now. Uh, uh, okay. go lucky. Nothing matters in the world. Victor M. Um, not everybody feels that way. There are people whose reality is too painful to face in a sober sense. I see. So for them, they need a euphoria and something that makes them feel good. In other words, just uh, uh, sort of anesthetize their problems. We all have problems and we cope with them. Mm. But there are certain people who feel that they need something external. And that's where people start to use drugs. That's why people get addicted, you know, in order to cover that reality. So what is this thing, Dr. Richard? It is, it is leaves, uh, when you come from the Soto, I'm sure you can tell us a little bit better. About this. It is leaves that are crushed and, 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 and then it is bent in a soil or sometimes it is put in cookies, uh, uh, the space muffins as, as they call them out there. So, so, so what is, what, as a sports physician, what, what are the physiological effects? What does it do to the heart? What does it do to, to, to the lungs? Let's forget about the brain and the mind. We'll get the psychiatrist to tell us about that. But what does it do to the rest of the body? Um, with the heart, it can increase your heart rate, mm. and therefore it will affect your blood pressure, mm. but it also affects your cardiac output, which mm. means that your ability for the heart to pump out blood can be affected. Now, when you move away from the chemical itself and you move into the mode of of dosing the, the medication is that um, you are smoking it. Mm. So if you smoke it, then you will suffer from all other disadvantages of smoking. Okay. And that is when it starts affecting your respiratory system. I don't want to say just the lungs because it starts your respiratory system. It starts from outside, from your nose, from your mouth, mm. down the pipes and then into, into the lungs. And because of the smoke inhalation problems, you can suffer from lung cancer. You can suffer from a condition that we call COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is also secondary to the burning effect of smoke inhalation through... Does it affect your appetite? Because it does. Okay, it does. It's, it's, a, it's a very, yes, it's a, a it's a very mm. high um, mm. appetite stimulant, mm. which to a certain extent is actually protective okay. because um, unlike uh, other drugs that uh, anesthetize you, like alcohol, where you lose your appetite and therefore you end up with a malnutrition problem. The, the, the Dacha smokers tend to maintain their appetite and therefore tend to eat well. Hey, and therefore, mm. they don't suffer from malnutrition problems, which would, which would then exacerbate other medical problems. Now, what does it do to the eyes? Some guys were for about four hours. It causes conjunctivitis. Shots. Conjunctivitis is okay. irritation of the layers of the eye. Mm. And there may be a perception that this is due to the smoking irritation, but it is not just that. Mm. The, 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 there's a chemical effect that actually affects the, the eye beyond the smoking. So even people who do not smoke it, who don't have that uh, physical irritation from the smoke, they, there's still a chemical effect that the, the, the compound has on their eyes. I, you wonder why people do this to themselves in their face. But Dr. Matana, let's just watch this insert that's going to tell us a little bit more about the long-term effects of marijuana. Let's see. There, there was a feeling at one time that cannabis didn't cause uh, either dependence or addiction. Dependence really means that your body needs the drug or the medication and cannot exist without it and that when you stop taking it, you go through something called a withdrawal symptom. Now, the, the drugs that do that the most are the drugs like heroin and morphine. Um, they really induce uh, quite a strong dependence. And then addiction is seen as the need to keep on taking the drug, and it's what we used to call psychological dependence. And addiction is also not, is, uh, now thought to occur with cannabis. It's not, not obviously a very strong induce of addiction, but it's strong enough. And the big fear about cannabis is that it certainly is what, what we would call a gateway drug. It's a drug that introduces uh, people to harder drugs like the cocaine, the methamphetamines, the heroin, uh, ketamine, etc. 
So that is one of the dangers about um, tetrahydrocannabinol. Now you can, you can purify marijuana, and when you purify that, when you take the, the resin out, which is called hashish, that makes a very strong uh, concentrated 9-tetrahydrocannabinol. And then it will obviously have very strong effects on the brain, you know, causing all of the things that we've said before, hallucinations, euphoria, but sometimes what we call dysphoria, anxiety, paranoia. Um, and not only that, it also affects the heart. It, um, it causes uh, what we call increased heart rate, tachycardia. Palpitations are also common. Um, and uh, it, it really does affect uh, the physiology to a large extent. Um, again, having said that, uh, it, there have been very few cases of people actually dying from cannabis uh, intoxication, from acute cannabis intoxication, uh, unlike that of cocaine and heroin, which can cause uh, death after acute intoxication. Dr. Matlan, I can understand the effects of peer pressure when young people have to start drinking alcohol, fueled by advertising that we see so much on television and everywhere else, similarly with cigarette, I guess. But why do people start taking marijuana? What, what, what gets people to start the habit in the first place? I think the myth about marijuana is that it's not a drug, it's a herb, and that it's somewhat innocuous. And it's been around in as far back as 2000 BC. Um, the first writings about it were in China. In South Africa, we uh, consume probably four times as much as the world average. So it's quite yes. common oh, in South Africa. Yes, <laughs> it's, it mm. is very scary. So it's ubiquitous, you find it everywhere. And um, because of that, unfortunate myth that you know you're just taking a herb or maybe the Rastafarians believe that it's part of a religious ceremony but for the most part most people take it as a recreation so they hang out with their peers and there's um, Zol passed around and they really truly believe that they know side effects but what we do see in practice is the unexpected and very severe consequences of um, cannabis and I say unexpected because the young people that come to us are often surprised that they're now landing up in a rehab center whereas they thought they were taking a herb mm. something that was natural and we often see psychotic disorders as a consequence of using um, cannabis and you know compared to the 1960s the concentration of the tetrahydrocannabinol the active ingredient has more than increased from about 10 milligrams it's now around 150 180 mm -hmm. if it's laced with hashish the resin that we listen to on um, this insert then it's even more potent and these patients often present with a lot of aggression um, psychotic symptoms so they have hallucinations delusions the perceptual disturbances that we spoke about and the good thing, though, unlike um, a condition such as schizophrenia and a unique differentiator, is with the withdrawal of the cannabis, they actually rapidly um, improve. Okay. We see improvements. So they, 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 can, they, they, can, they can rapidly improve just by withdrawing. But quickly, before we go to the end break, now, when a person has taken marijuana, it differs from person to person. Because some people say, I smoke this thing and nothing really happens. And some people, they smoke it and you can see that they've gone completely berserk. So it does it affect individuals differently? Yes, you know, uh, to each his own. Um, there are people who've got a higher tolerance of the, the nine tetrahydrocannabinol, and there are people who've got very poor tolerance. Now, the, the, the people will tell you, I've been smoking this for 25 years, nothing happens. It's a myth. Mm. Something happens. Mm. I mean, you can't, take, you can't take something, a drug, for no reason. Mm. They do have uh, euphoria effects, but maybe they contain the euphoria, euphoria effect much better. You know, there's also a myth that it helps people work harder. You know, in some factories, people believe that they work Eish. better when they've smoked. It's, it, it is nonsensical because marijuana induces what is called uh, lethargy. You know, uh, cannabis induced lethargy. Mm. They actually become lethargic, you know. So it is not true that it improves pro production. Uh, people have got various myth, myth, mythical beliefs about it, and this is a no good drug. Dr. Adisha, is it commonly abused in South African sports? Um, maybe not necessarily in South African sports, but it is in South Africa. So and, obviously, and then South Africans play sports. Yeah, so, so and the <laughs> South Africans will play sports. So it's, will... It's, it's very common because, yeah. like, um, 
it was said, it's very, very ubiquitous. It's very easy to get. It mm. grows. You drop a seed, it grows. It grows. Everybody mm. has had some form of... Uh, that, yeah, I can't keep it yeah, It's yeah. very, very easy to yeah. get. The other thing also is that we are in an African setting. Mm. And there's a very strong relationship between Africans and, and herbs and plants and things that just grow. I'm not sure about that. So, I'm not sure about that. So mm. <laughs> the, the, it's, it, 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 it's part of us. It's part of our culture. It's part of our, yeah. our tradition. The other thing also is that it's been around for much longer than the other new mainline drugs in, in so far as the, the rural South African, African context. We'll talk about that and the fact that it is a gateway. But I get sense of knowledge in We'll continue our discussion on marijuana. You stay with us. Now, after many years of various individuals and lobby groups that have been trying to get this substance considered for some form of legalization, there is finally a piece of legislation that has been tabled to the South African Parliament, the Medicine Innovation Bill, which talks about many other things about the medicinal use of marijuana. But let's see if this is or if there's any credence to this assertion. Let's watch. There's a lot of work that has been done on cannabis. There's um, a whole lot of work that has been done on what they call now medical marijuana, which uh, is a big thing in the, the States. I think there's, I think, 13 or 15 American states um, that allow marijuana um, to be dispensed to certain people who have got things like chronic pain, uh, it's also supposed to work in glaucoma, uh, patients that have cancer chemotherapy who have severe nausea, uh, there have also been patients that uh, have got multiple sclerosis, and um, there's, there's still a lot of debate about medical marijuana, about whether it, it should be allowed or not. But Certainly in, in selected patients, it does look like it, it does work. Um, it must be pointed out that um, a lot of the time uh, there, there is a feeling that, these, that the medical marijuana is being abused by the patients and, it, and it's, they're still using it to get high uh, rather than using it for purely medicinal purposes. So I, I think we're still very early on in, in that debate about whether medical marijuana is uh, safe and effective. We do know that 9-tetrahydrocannabinol um, and, and some of its analogs do have some medicinal value. Um, and uh, as I've said, uh, in glaucoma, because it lowers the pressure in the eye, uh, it's been shown to, to work in asthma, um, cause a bit of bronchodilation, uh, for chronic pain, it changes pain perception um, and as an anti-nausea drug and, and also might also be quite useful in HIV patients because in HIV patients they often lose their appetite and uh, we also know that cannabis stimulates the appetite. Mm. Yeah, and we're also joined by Dr. Trevor Majoro, who's an HIV clinician who comes all the way from Deben Teguin to join us this morning. Dr. Majoro, thank you for joining us this morning. Good Deben Teguin, tell us about Deben poison. <laughs> well, Deben poison is the other name that is given to cannabis. Mm. But I, I'd, I'd like to comment on the point that he said about the fact that most HIV patients do smoke uh, cannabis. I think it, it's quite tricky there because a lot of people who test, as you know, day one to day seven, you can still find cannabis in the urine. The, the, the metabolite, mm -hmm. where somebody uses it ac acutely or lightly, but where they've been using it for a long time, you can find it even within a month from the time they stopped. So the challenge with HIV is efavirenz, a drug called efavirenz, mm -hmm. which is part of what we used in fixed dose combination to treat HIV as first line regimen. Mm -hmm. Some of the patients who are on efavirenz, if you test them for cannabis metabolites, it tests positive, so it's a false positive. So there are patients who will be accused of smoking marijuana 
when actually it's because of the effavirenz. Two other drugs that give you that is ibuprofen and naproxen. Mm. Patients with arthritis or gout who are using that medication for a short period of at least five days, they can also te test false positive oh for my. cannabis. This is very sad. Yes. Because I was approached by somebody who was going to be tested uh, for a job, big job. And he says, hey, man, came to me and said, hey, man, Dr. Ramatis, you know, yeah, man, I have to tell you, I will say this, so I'm going to a test. How many days since I last smoked, you know, should I stay, uh, or how, when, should I, when is it safe to test? so that to, to ensure that, you know, uh, my test does not indicate that I am an abuser of this thing. So, so yeah. you say some people may not be using the drug at all. Yes. But because they're using certain medications and they might test positive. This Ibuprofen, positive. naproxen, and efavirenz, yeah. those three drugs, yeah. you can get false positives. And importantly as well, therefore, in the history, you've got to ask somebody to be very honest and authentic mm. in the history. You must ask them, do you smoke cannabis? If they say yes, when was the last time you actually smoked it? Because when you smoked it lightly, like I say, you can still pick it up within a week. If you've been smoking it for a longer time, in this case more than a week, you can pick it within a month after the last day of having stopped taking it. Dr. Matana, don't say it depends now. You said <laughs> South Africans <laughs> smoke four times the, the world average of marijuana. Do you want to divide it provincially? Is there a province that seems to be smoking more than the rest of the I don't have the stats on provinces, but I would suspect that Natal might be leading. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I'm not high. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Why would you suspect that case that Ed is a culprit here? Yeah, because there's a special fine um, Durban poison yeah. that, um, where, you know, particularly um, comes from that part of the, the country. Mm. But I don't have statistics provincially about um, But can you tell me why, 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 why why ladies will find marijuana fashionable uh, and because I mean uh, it, it's it's a ugly soul I mean and, mm -hmm. and it smells ugly and, and, and why, why would ladies take up to well I'm not sure ladies find uh, marijuana fashionable at all mm -hmm. I think um, usually when people consume it it's you know in adolescence it's a recreational drug and then I think in Cosa culture Perhaps in the past, women would smoke, but it's certainly anything that causes weight gain for women is potentially off-putting. Mm -hmm. So I doubt that women would <laughs> want to smoke marijuana. So they marijuana. take it in food, in, 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 in the space muffins? Well, know. maybe at a party, mm -hmm. they, they might serve you know, those um, muffins, but it's not necessarily the, the drug of choice for, for women. What is a drug of choice for women? Women, well, in my clinical practice, when I was in private practice, patients tended to go for more appetite-suppressing kind of drugs, the amphetamines, the psychostimulants. So they'd use cat or cocaine because part of the side effects were beneficial to them, which was weight loss. Mm -hmm. So that women preferentially chose those kind of drugs. But alcohol was their primary um, drug or substance of use. Let's talk about this thing of marijuana being the gateway. To the, to the abuse of, of other heavier drugs that Dr. Matlan has just spoken about, cocaine, tea, and the rest. How, how, how does this work? It works in this way. As, you, you, as the smoker starts, you know, it gives them that kick, and then as it goes on, they have to smoke more and more you know, to get the same kick. So what happens is that uh, a cannabis is very, is very amenable to mixture with uh, other things. You can mix it with anything else, and it will burn. So it's easier. So they start introducing uh, uh, stuff like heroin. They start introducing stuff like effavirenz. You spoke about effavirenz. Some people mix it with effavirenz and it gives them a high. So it's easy to mix. And it also uh, uh, they, they develop tolerance with time and they want something more. You know? And so that's how it becomes the gateway. Dr. Dicham, we've seen some boxers in South Africa testing positive. Um, for marijuana over the years since the establishment of the South African Institute for Drug Police Sport. We have not quite seen it in the other sporting codes. Why, why would you find the boxers you know, using this drug? Because looking at the physiological effects, it doesn't seem to give them any advantage. It does. <coughs> there is no performance enhancing advantage from marijuana. Why do but you there are it? other there are other physiological advantages. One of the things that has been alluded to already is the pain management situation, it does alleviate pain. It also gives a false sense of confidence. It mm -hmm. gives euphoria. Mm -hmm. So boxing, one would imagine that uh, there would be a little bit of anxiety because it's a fight. Mm -hmm. So you would want something that will calm you down and make you feel deluded a little bit and make you feel strong. However, that is mythical as well. 
because in that space, it gives you that false sense of confidence, but you heard that from the insights that it's actually paradoxical mm -hmm. in the sense that it can then give you a aggression and anxiety. However, maybe you need the aggression because maybe you, you need the aggression if you're going to box. You need something that will help you through the But it mustn't be false. It, it, it must be the normal aggression that you have because yes. it, it can be the, aggressive. Mm. The, the problem also with Ariana that is mythical in, in, in intake in sport is that it actually does the opposite. It's not egogenic, it's egolictic. Mm -hmm. It's got psychomotor retardation, it's got a perception distortion, it's got a memory and concentration impairment. So it actually is detrimental to their athletes, but I the athletes imagine. don't know that and they mm -hmm. don't believe that and the myths that have been spread are the, the, the false impressions that yeah. the athletes think it is beneficial. Right, it's but actually the detrimental. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Matana, before we go to the ad break, what is this uh, inertia or uh, a motivational syndrome that is associated with marijuana? Okay, so you get two types of marijuana users. So the occasional users that um, don't have very high levels of cannabis use. You get those that use daily high doses for many years. And what we know about those individuals is that, especially if they have a predilection, so an underlying propensity to develop a psychiatric disorder, those are the people that are most likely to develop schizophrenia after years of use, right? So that, that the increase in, in terms of, it, it increases about four or six fold your risk of developing schizophrenia. There's another group of people, however, that are difficult to distinguish from the group of people People with schizophrenia who also have a psychotic syndrome they're in and out of psychosis a chronic psychosis and what we know about the cannabis as has been described earlier is the lethargy that it causes the slowing down the retardation so they get that an apathy lack of energy that looks very similar to the negative symptoms of schizophrenia and they can't function I suppose they don't function and, and, very and well yes if it's a teacher you're in trouble Yes. A, a, as a student. Yes. Medicinal use, do you think in, in, in the few sentences mm -hmm. that it, it is something that will see the light of day in South Africa? I think it, it is something that should be considered for medicinal use, but I must say that it's going to be a challenge to monitor it mm -hmm. because obviously, as you know, you know, everything that is being put out there for a particular specific purpose, then misperceptions come through where people will now overuse it mm -hmm. for different reasons. We That's already have a problem now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if people can abuse aspirin, you know, you can imagine, it doesn't give them that high. Mm. So you can imagine what happens if we are told marijuana is for medicinal purposes and is specific to these conditions. Surely, there's going to be a bigger door of abuse than the medicinal. But that, having said, doesn't mean that it shouldn't be considered mm. for those specific uh, uh, conditions where it, it, it may help, as we saw it in, in Parliament. I mean, mm. people are, are feeling guilty about something that they should not. You know, the law should take its course. If it didn't happen before somebody passed on, so, so, so it is someone else will benefit, but at least they've highlighted, they applied, and maybe that will pro propel or fast track the process of considering. It remains the a legacy the of, of yes. Mario Ambrosini. Yes. When we return, we'll continue our discussion on marijuana. You stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching Bonita's House Call here on SABC2. And today we're discussing marijuana, a substance that many people in this country have been known to abuse in various settings, especially in some of our sport. But does it really improve sports performance? You be the judge. Um, it's interesting that marijuana is not really a performance enhancing drug. Um, there's very little research to see how it affects sporting performance. And in fact, um, from the known effects of marijuana, it probably has a negative effect um, on sporting performance. We know that it does influence the heart rate and the volume of uh, blood that the heart pumps out with each beat, which has in fact a negative uh, effect on performance. Um, it's interesting that uh, we don't really see a, a specific prevalence of the use or abuse of marijuana in any particular sport. So where it has been used, it's been acro used across all sports. Uh, but what is interesting, in fact, is that it's less prevalent amongst athletes than it is amongst, amongst the general population. Marijuana is, in fact, the, the one substance which, although prohibited in sport, has been the most talked about, um, particularly because it doesn't seem to have a performance-enhancing effect. 
So prohibited substances are not only prohibited because of their performance enhancing effect or potential, but in fact there are other reasons and that is why marijuana is prohibited. And that is primarily for the potential for health risk. So substances are often prohibited because of their potential to inhibit health or have ill health, health effects. And that is primarily the reason for, um, for the effects or the banning of marijuana. But also in addition to that, it's, it's also that it may have negative effects not only for the individual, but for others. So if, for example, you have a participant who is involved, let's say, in archery or pistol shooting and happens to be on marijuana and has certain effects where they are maybe uh, less focused, maybe have more inhibition, um, and potentially there's danger in that environment. Mm. I can see you smile. <laughs> Dr. Nisha. Goalkeepers, I mean, you know, you know, you know goalkeepers are, are pretty much in football eccentric characters. And I think it has to do with the position that they have to fill. They're the last line of defense that they have to do almost the impossible, stopping those balls. And years gone by, you find a lot of goalkeepers, possibly because of the pressure of that position, abusing marijuana. Would you agree with this? Not, not my experience. Okay. Not my experience. But there was one favorite goalkeeper uh, of mine yeah. who used to use it to play for, 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 for the backs. Very for another parents. That must be many years ago. Though, because we are now in the PSL, <laughs> the players are being tested almost week in, week I've out. Been, and, and, and Dr. Years. Richard has been the Super Sport United yeah, for I've more than a tested, decade. I've never tested yeah. marijuana. So, so, so a lot has gone in, in education. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so what is your view? Generally in sports, we shouldn't really worry. We should keep testing because mm -hmm. that's a deterrent. Yes. Um, like the good professor has said, mm -hmm. there isn't any performance enhancing effect. However, you should understand why we prohibit substances. The first reason for prohibiting substances is to protect other athletes from you. Mm -hmm. Because then uh, it, if it's a performance enhancer, there's a, a, an unfair advantage. But the other aspect, which is just as strong as the first one, is, pro is to protect you from you. Mm -hmm. You should remember that our basic job is we are doctors. Mm -hmm. And our primary responsibility is to protect health. So we will not allow anything that has a, any form of risk to the health of the athlete and, and others. And like the, the professor has said, uh, there's a lot of psychomotor impairment. Judgment is poor, concentration is poor. We've already spoken about aggressive uh, potential. So we will not allow that amongst our athletes. Like he said, if it's a, a weapon-related uh, sport, it can then it can, it can it, it risk others. But let's talk, let's talk about Bob Marley a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bob Marley Bob died of cancer of the lungs, CA bronchus, mm -hmm. cancer of the lungs. Mm -hmm. And there's always a postulation that it would have been as a result of Dacha smoking, which was a ritual practice in his Rastafarian religion. Mm -hmm. Now, is, is, is Dacha or marijuana more potent in causing all those problems that are associated with smoking in general as opposed to tobacco? Absolutely. If you look at tobacco and compare it to cannabis, uh, uh, tobacco is about 17 chemicals and cannabis got 69 mm. chemicals. <laughs> Most of these are carcinogenic. So it can cause Me, cancer. Yeah, they can yeah. cause so cancer. So there's credence in the, in the, in the assertion that yeah. Bob Marley could have, could have died. Absolutely. Of, so Talking of, of Bob Marley, we can also talk of Peter Tosh, who wanted it legalized. It, oh, yeah. Legalized. And he named all sorts of things that he would advertise. <laughs> it was good for asthma, good for tuberculosis. So it has certain so. properties. Yeah. 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 It has it certain properties. Man. And yeah. in fact, there's also some antibiotic properties that we may not mention, mm. uh, although being small. So it encourages people to smoke. But yes, Bob Marley died as a result of that. But some information I got was that he had a melanoma. Is it? Yeah. OK. So it's, it, it's, it's questionable. The jury's out there whether he had lung cancer or he had melanoma that spread. But nevertheless, it soul. was a cancer. Bless his soul. And the people. Dr. Mutlana, that you'd want to advise, or if you are one, two, three, four, five, don't even start smoking marijuana because it's going to make you mad, completely bonkers. I would say as a baseline that nobody should be experimenting <laughs> with marijuana. <laughs> You're speaking like a real doctor, now. Let's, let's get here. <laughs> uh, in fact, mm. I can't encourage anybody. Yes. I'd say that we don't know what underlying risk factors genetically you're carrying, what 
like what the likelihood, the propensity is for you to develop a major psychiatric disorder or not. And although those people who experiment and very quickly have hallucinogenic um, experiences, become anxious, paranoid, should really not venture any further. But I think for everybody it carries a risk of becoming dependent and it's a gateway, as I said, to other substances. So I would absolutely discourage all young people and older adults mm -hmm. from smoking cannabis and we really underestimate the potency that it has now, the fact that it's mixed with other substances and I think that it is a dangerous drug. What does it do to a person with a bipolar? Well, Cannabis and all the other substance disorders make all psychiatric disorders difficult to manage. Excellent. So a person with bipolar disorder, especially because of the euphoria, might be switched into a manic state where now their, their condition is even worse. They're high, their judgment is gone, they have um, irresponsible behavior, their judgment is impacted, and all those other consequences. And it makes or most psychiatric disorders are very difficult to treat. And if the patients don't tell that the psychiatrist, the doctor treating them that they're on substances, we, we juggle with medication, upping doses, whereas in fact, it's not the fact that the medications aren't working, they're using substances. So I would discourage anybody with any psychiatric disorder from smoking or taking any other substances. Now, you've practiced in, in Davidton, you are now in KZN, you've been all over in academia. Now, you do come across patients who, who, who smoke marijuana, some of them as an incidental finding. Now, at what point would you refer somebody who smokes marijuana for some form of special treatment? At what form and, and how exactly is that affected? Generally, the first thing they do is people deny that they're using it. And, and I think it's very difficult to pick up somebody who uses marijuana. And so this takes us back to basic clinical skills from healthcare workers to say medicine is not only about the science, it's more about the persona as well. Mm -hmm. If you allow patients to be who they are in your space without being judgmental to them, information like this, they will volunteer. Because as my colleagues have said, there is no specific symptom that is pathognomonic to abuse or use. That is typical. That is typical mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. using marijuana. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on your skills. But from my clinical experience, one, people have volunteered it because sometimes you think you're treating something else. Somebody presents with one particular problem all the time. Fatigue or generalized body weakness is one of them. You know, you screen for everything. You find that they don't have any existing organic disease. And in most cases, these are professional people. You don't even suspect. Yes. And then mm. you don't even think about doing a urine test to check for the metabolite because it's the last place, according to your own perception, you think it could be. And this that's is a actually lawyer, and yes, this is an and that's actually and, where it mm, is because ish. most people now actually experiment with them, and and at, at at that level. So I would say the first thing is to have a good clinical acumen, openness, and secondly, don't be shy to ask certain questions mm. to patients. Don't be shy to ask a patient, do you use a condom when you have sex? Don't be shy. Don't be shy to ask, do, are there substances that you use other than the normal food and drinks that you take? Because that is basic history, and it's not personal. It's not about whether you, you hate them or not, but it's about you wanting to find out the holistic picture that cannot be presented from signs that you can see from Hold them. You there. want that background. Hold it there. When you come back from the break, we'll also talk about marijuana and sexual performance. We'll continue our discussion on marijuana after the break. Welcome back. One is Rosa Pelagato, Salita Simona Bonita's house call or SABC2. Today, yes, Dr. Majoro, sexual performance and marijuana. Yeah. And the relationship? <laughs> I, th I think you heard what my colleague tells you. I mean, I mean, told you. Mm. It, it's the same scenario with alcohol. It's, it's the euphoria. You know, the, the mm. people confuse the euphoria they get from marijuana to the euphoria they get from the actual activity of sex. Mm. We heard how it retards performance. Mm. So basically, performance is related to motor activity. Mm. In terms of that euphoria, that is related often to nervous stimulation and therefore emotional hype. Mm. It's more related to the excitement from the marijuana mm. than the actual sex. I don't know about the additive effect of the two, mm. but surely people have told us that they, you know, when they've smoked, they go for, for, for longer rounds, some say for many rounds. You know, 
Uh, I, I don't know, know the you, essence, you know, the you know the stories that. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but generally now, shifting now from that from sex to sexual offences and the aggression that Dr. Richaba spoke about and everything else, does it necessarily marijuana make people more amenable to committing crime? Very, very. Um, mm -hmm. During my, my, my work in forensic units, you know, uh, we found that uh, almost 90% uh, of offenders, violent crimes, mm -hmm. had done it under the influence of marijuana, including uh, sex, uh, uh, sexual offenses, rape mm -hmm. and murder. Mm -hmm. So it does actually uh, make people to act very, very aggressively if they can. You use it, can you use it as extenuating circumstances when uh, you're arguing for a, for a lighter sentence? That thankfully, the law that never the law never takes any alcoholic or any intoxication Eyeball. by any agent yeah. as an excuse of com for committing a crime. No, you can't say yeah. that. It yeah. doesn't work like no, that. No, you can't. You can't even say I'm Dr. Chavana or Dr. Motana's patient mm. when you've committed a rape. Yeah. You go in. Yeah. And I want those uh, 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 autists to know that we're not there to protect people who commit offenses under the influence of any alcohol or any intoxicating substances. Because people think psychiatrists, we get people off the hook, we don't. Okay. Mm -mm. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, no. We, we, we've, seen, we, we've seen a bit of that. Dr. Richard, we may not get another opportunity to do this, but what, what way have you gone to, to, to sports people out there, especially the young ones? You know, as South Africa, we have become a very inactive nation, and we are trying to get as many people as possible across the walks of life, across the age spectrums, to, to participate in sport. But for young people out there who engage in sport, not only as a recreational activity, but also as you know, something that they compete and everything, and where performance and winning at all costs might be an issue, what word of advice have you got for sports people out there? Um, as it relates to Dacha or marijuana, I just want to warn everybody, sports or no sports, recreational or professional, it is a dangerous drug like the good doctors have alluded to. It is very, very dangerous. It is deleterious to the body. It does not enhance performance. It doesn't. And to me, honestly, there's really no point for a sports person to, to take it except for negative, uh, for negative reasons. It will impair their, their, their sporting performance. It is illegal. So that also get arrested. Say, they'll get arrested and as get well. So up in jail. as far as I'm concerned, even if I'm not being judgmental and moralistic and I'm just being technical, I do not see any any useful reason why anybody think, would want to. I think that Dakar. point has been emphasized well mm -hmm. enough. Dr. Matlana, what has been the most frustrating aspect of treating people who've got a marijuana problem? I think for us, what's really difficult is addressing and trying to deal with the myths around marijuana. Whereas alcohol and the other hard drugs, people recognize that there's a potentially detrimental effect to their health, to their brains. With cannabis, it's so difficult mm -hmm. to shift that whole conversation and really take on marijuana as a real drug. And for example, in South Africa, we don't test drivers for marijuana. So when they've been driving, we test them for alcohol, we test them for alcohol but, we test them for but it's probably yeah. more dangerous. Pilots need to be tested. Hopefully they don't mm. um, take any marijuana. So we underestimate the effects on our society. Crimes are committed on marijuana. Mm. So I think it's having those conversations and with the push towards a medicinal use of marijuana, it makes our work even more difficult mm. because whilst we're saying this is a dangerous drug, we, on the other hand, there are these medicinal uses and purposes and for which really the science is scant mm -hmm. and I'm afraid that the possible negative consequences of legalizing it are worse than keeping it illegal. Hmm. You guys are very opinionated on that. Now, maybe you want to oppose what Dr. Majoro was saying a little bit earlier, that there is no pathognomonic sign. In other words, there's no something that typifies a person who's smoking marijuana. But the point that he made, which I found very interesting, was that there are a lot of professionals, very snooty and nice people, that you won't even suspect that they are, that, that they are abusing the drug. What are some of the things that you might pick up in an individual that might say to, hey, here, I might have to test the urine for marijuana? Yeah, Victor, the, 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 I agree with him. However, there are certain things. I mean, you get people uh, who complain, or the family, you complain of intermittent episodes of aggression. Mm. That's the typical one. Okay. That this person sometimes goes out, and when they come back, they're like a wild bull. Mm -hmm. You look at their eyes, they like they want to charge. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have to suspect that, you know? You have to suspect uh, episodes of aggression or, or changes in appetite. Mm. You know, they develop what is called the munchies, and they... They munch away, mm -hmm. you know, and neglecting um, and neglecting responsibilities. Mm -hmm. That's another issue. 
Sure. But my bonnet Montana to your king, who was a sober good and We'll talk about discussion on marijuana when we return. You stay with us. You're watching Bonita Sounds Call here on SABC2, and welcome back. Bakais, Mohang, Wheeler, Bora, Morocco, and Telago, Morocco, and Mafocat, and Musso, who talk about Sana Peba, and Mora, and Timosen, Wahong Pion. Dr. Majoro, see by beginning to get back, or that way to move forward to that. They have all explained that they've given us their key messages. Coming from KZN, where we suspect that uh, <laughs> 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 even, even in traditional ceremonies, uh, that even, even in, in cultural settings, that there's a general accepted use of the drug. What are the key messages today? Well, my message is the greatest high you can ever get in your life has got nothing to do with what comes outside your body. It has got more to do with your physical mind, perceiving beyond feeling and thinking and discovering the very seat of who you really are originally, the That's spirit itself. That's highly philosophical. Yes. Huh? So once you discover that you are bigger than your body, you are bigger than your brain, you are bigger than your mind, there's something too original. You are only wearing this body. If you are able to taste that high every day, even if it's for a few milliseconds, you are okay. Dr. Ali Chabai said it does not enhance sport performance. And uh, uh, out like that. <laughs> <laughs> it does not enhance sports performance, and he said it is a problem in South Africa, Absolutely. and we, we must always watch out for it. And you are saying, Dr. Motlana, it can complicate, it can aggravate, it can make other psychiatric conditions very difficult to treat. Yes. And what is the message in that? The message is and stay away from marijuana. Say no if you're a young person, don't experiment. That the consequences are not just bad in terms of your physical health, your mental health, but also socially. Mm. Um, being responsible for crime, accidents on the road, there really isn't a positive message that I can convey about the use of marijuana. And anything that tobacco causes, marijuana will cause, will worse four will. times or even five exactly. times worse. Ah, oh, what a lovely subject. What a lovely subject. I mean, has a huge panel just to talk about one small drug, Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or DAH, it is called. Dr. Shabalala, Dr. Dichaba, Dr. Matlana, Dr. Majoro. Thank you very much, guys. We'll come back and discuss some of the other interesting subjects of this nature just before the festive season break. Panabes, Holuna Bosch, Levarati, Batsi, Hetzi, Batta, Sendi, Bako, Tumesi, Kassitana, Bamanu, Kimbal, Nano, Lem, Ker, Danke, Hamwe, Danke, Habedi, Danke, Harar. Hadi, Allah, Udiela, Dichala, Remeno, Lathabela. We'll come back next Saturday with another interactive show. Right here on SABC2 at 8.30 in the morning. Our company is happy to begin with that. Tanto Haile Amre. Thanks for joining us today. From me, Dr. Victor Ramurese Ramatisen, you take care.